Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Wan, and I'm the Senior Analyst for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention here at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. I would like to welcome you to today's re interactive webinar, How State Public Health Can Sustain and Support the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. ASTO, with support from the HHS Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, is working on this exciting new project to assess the current uses of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans and to educate and mobilize state health leadership to utilize and integrate the guidelines throughout agency programming. ASTO is working to capture state stories, develop an issue brief, and other resources to support the implementation of the guidelines, which will all be available on ASTO's website. In addition, today's webinar is the first in the series of three webinars in the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans webinar series and will be posted to our website in the next couple of days. The objectives for today's webinar are to provide an overview of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans and to highlight the various ways state health agencies can utilize the Physical Activity Guidelines including supporting physical activity internally through state health official leadership and worksite wellness programs, and partnering with academia and other sectors to develop a statewide physical activity plan. We have an esteemed panel of experts that will be speaking with you today. If you have a question, you are welcome to post it in the chat box at the lower left-hand corner of your screen at any time during the webinar. These questions will be used during the Q&A at the end of today's presentations. Following the webinar, we will be providing a link to an evaluation in the chat box. Please take a few minutes to inform us about the work you are doing to increase physical activity in your state and provide us feedback on today's webinar. We look forward to hearing about your efforts. Our first speaker is Dr. Katrina Butner. Dr. Butner is a physical activity and nutrition advisor with the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in the Division of Prevention Science at HHS. Her work involves the planning, coordination, and dissemination of the key recommendations from the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. I will now turn it over to Dr. Butner. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon. I'm going to start today's webinar by providing a brief background of the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans and provide information about how the guidelines were developed, the recommendations contained in the guidelines, and share some information about a mid-course report, which will be released soon. As the evidence base for the health benefits of physical activity grew, there was a noticeable void in the realm of federal recommendations. Although the U.S. government has maintained the dietary guidelines for Americans since 1980, there had never been a parallel set of evidence-based guidelines for physical activity. Realizing the potential public health benefit, the federal government responded to this need for comprehensive recommendations and initiated development of the physical activity guidelines for Americans in early 2007. The first edition of the guidelines was released in 2008. First was a systematic and thorough collection of the evidence surrounding the health benefits of physical activity. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention led this endeavor, which required review of over 1,700 peer-reviewed publications. Meanwhile, a federal advisory committee was established, comprised of 13 outside scientists with expertise in medicine, kinesiology, physiology, and public health. Over nine months, this committee held three public meetings to review and discuss the available body of evidence and how that evidence would shape their recommendations. In the spring of 2008, the committee compiled their findings into a 683-page report that was presented to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. At that point, a team of physical activity experts from HHS crafted the Physical Activity Guidelines policy document based on these recommendations. The authors were successful in translating a thorough and dense committee report into a straightforward and actionable collection of guidance for all Americans ages 6 and older, guidelines that are designed to promote optimum health and help prevent chronic disease. The guidelines are intended for those over age 6, and they are further broken down into specific recommendations for the various population groups which are displayed on the slide. As for the age 6 cutoff, the published science at that time simply wasn't robust enough to make specific recommendations for those under age six, although younger children are certainly encouraged to play actively. Adults and youth with disabilities are more likely to be inactive than those without disabilities. Individuals with disabilities should work with their health care provider to understand the types and amounts of physical activity appropriate for them and, when possible, should meet the guidelines. 
However, if individuals are not able to participate in appropriate physical activities to meet the guidelines, they should be as active as possible and avoid inactivity. Guidance is also provided for both aerobic activity and non-aerobic muscle strengthening and bone strengthening activities. Finally, the guidelines were clearly written to allow people the utmost flexibility in determining how they will be physically active. For example, the recommended length of time for adults is over the course of a week rather than a daily recommendation, a reflection of the science, and also a way for people to more easily incorporate physical activity into their busy lives. The authors realized that the guidelines must be doable if any real public health impact can be expected. Before discussing the specifics of the guidelines, I'd like to provide a quick reminder of some of the benefits of being physically active. Each of these is supported by strong scientific evidence. In addition to the items on this list, there's also moderate evidence to support a beneficial impact on functional ability among older adults, risk of hip fracture and osteoporosis, risk of lung and endometrial cancers, sleep quality, and weight maintenance after weight loss. Obviously, quite an impressive list, particularly for a lifestyle factor that we can individually control. Now I'll focus on the specific recommendations, starting with the guidelines for the adult population, which is age 18 and older. With aerobic activity, it's broken into moderate and vigorous categories, with the recommendation of 150 minutes or two and a half hours per week of moderate activity, or 75 minutes, roughly one hour and 15 minutes of vigorous activity, or a combination of the two. Basically, one minute of moderate activity, uh, basically one minute of moderate activity is essentially equivalent to two minutes of vigorous. And very generally, moderate intensity activities are those in which you can talk but not sing, and vigorous intensity activities are those where you may have trouble carrying on a conversation. Some additional information about the guidelines. Aerobic activity should be performed in episodes of at least 10 minutes to gain the health benefits. If you want to jump up and down for a minute, that's not a bad thing to do. It'll certainly wake you up a bit, but 10 minute bouts are recommended for the sake of health impact. There's not a specific minimum for frequency, but generally spreading out activity throughout the week is most beneficial. As I mentioned previously, the guidelines for an, are for an overall amount of time during the week not necessarily a specific amount per day. Also note that there is large variability among individuals as to the amount of physical activity required for a healthy weight. Also, please keep in mind these are recommendations for overall health benefits. There are no known upper limits where the benefits of physical activity no longer increase. Muscle strengthening should be done at a moderate to high intensity level two or more days a week and include all major muscle groups. So what are the take-home messages for the adult population? Something's better than nothing, and more activity tends to be better in terms of the health benefits. In addition, muscle strengthening provides additional health benefits beyond those achieved with aerobic activities. Obviously, physical activity is very important for children and adolescents, as well as adults. Youth who are regularly active have many of the same benefits I mentioned earlier for adults. Active youth also have a better chance of a healthy adulthood, given that regular physical activity makes it less likely that risk factors for chronic diseases will develop. Youth can achieve substantial health benefits by doing moderate and vigorous intensity physical activity for periods of time that add up to 60 minutes, or one hour, or more each day. These activity, this activity should include aerobic activity as well as age-appropriate muscle and bone strengthening activities. Children and adolescents should meet the guidelines by doing activity that is appropriate for their age. For example, younger children may primarily engage in physical activity on a playground, while older adolescents may be more involved in organized sports. Most of the 60 minutes or more a day should be either moderate or vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity, and should include vigorous intensity physical activity at least three days a week. It's important to note that children's natural pattern of movement differs from those of adults. Children are naturally active in a more intermittent way, particularly when they do unstructured, unstructured active play. During recess and in their free play and games, children use basic aerobic and bone strengthening activities, such as running, hopping, skipping, and jumping, 
to develop movement pattern and skills. They alternate brief periods of moderate and vigorous intensity physical activity with brief periods of rest. So among children, any episode of moderate or vigorous intensity physical activity, however brief, counts towards the guidelines. As part of their 60 minutes or more of daily physical activity, children and adolescents should include muscle strengthening physical activity at least three days a week. As with adults, muscle strengthening activities should work all of the major muscle groups with a moderate to high level of effort. Typically, children do not need to engage in formal weight training. Many of their natural activities including mu include muscle strengthening components. Some examples include games such as tug of war, push-ups and curl-ups, and swinging on playground equipment. Also, children and adolescents should include bone strengthening physical activity at least three days of the week. Bone strengthening activities are especially important for children and younger adolescents because the greatest gains in bone mass occur during the years just before and during puberty. In addition, the majority of peak bone mass is obtained by the end of adolescence. Some examples of bone strengthening activities include games such as hopscotch, skipping, jumping rope, gymnastics, tennis, and running sports such as basketball. One of the central themes of the physical activity guidelines is the flexibility for people to meet the guidelines their way rather than following a highly prescriptive exercise routine. That theme is reinforced with our communications products, which are centered around the title, Be Active Your Way. Alongside the guidelines themselves, HHS developed a toolkit of supplementary materials, including a Be Active Your Way booklet, which was designed for adults with limited health literacy and is attractive and accessible to all, a fact sheet for professionals and adults, a user's guide for implementing the physical activity guidelines in the community, and some motivational posters. The Be Active Your Way booklet and fact sheet for adults have also been translated into Spanish. The toolkit was distributed to individuals and organizations that signed on as part of the, of the PAG supporter network, a communication and distribution list of folks who support the guidelines and commit to implementing them in their realms. There are currently over 5,000 members of the supporter network, and members receive announcement of upcoming events, new blog posts, and other pertinent information. We also have a Be Active Your Way blog with over 12 guest bloggers from various supporter organizations, including the American College of Sports Medicine and the YMCA, who rotate in authoring weekly posts. The blog receives over 30,000 visits monthly and also periodically features news and reports and program spotlight features in addition to weekly posts. As I've discussed, the physical activity guidelines were first released in 2008. And since then, there has been considerable interest in providing regular updates to the guidelines. Although there continues to be more research and new findings in the realm of physical activity, a federal steering committee believed there would be little change to the current physical activity guidelines if they were updated in 2013. Therefore, a steering committee felt a mid-course report would provide an opportunity to review and highlight a specific topic of importance related to the physical activity guidelines and an opportunity to, to communicate the findings of this review to the public. The Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans mid-course report will be released this spring. Briefly, to give you a little information about the report, for the mid-course report, a subcommittee of experts in physical activity was convened to examine the evidence on intervention strategies to increase physical activity among youth. Five main settings where youth live, learn, and play are contained in the report, including school, preschool and child care, community, family and home, and primary care, as demonstrated on this slide. Although the recommendations for youth under age six are not contained in the physical activity guidelines, the subcommittee thought it was important to review intervention strategies for youth ages three to six as well. Therefore, the Physical Activity Guidelines mid-course report includes intervention strategies to increase physical activity among youth ages three to 17. And lastly, all information pertaining to the Physical Activity Guidelines can be retrieved at www.health.gov backslash PA guidelines, including the guidelines themselves, the supporting consumer and professional resources, the Be Active Your Way blog, a sign up for the supporters network, and the original committee report on which the guidelines are based. Information about the physical activity guidelines mid-course report will also be available soon on the same website. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Dr. Butner, for that great overview of the guidelines. As you can see on your screen, we now have a polling question up. True or false, health-related benefits of aerobic activity can be achieved in episodes of at least 10 minutes. Please go ahead and submit your answers now while I introduce our next speaker. Our second speaker is Chris Lindley. Mr. Lindley leads the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment's Prevention Service Division overseeing all the department's prevention efforts, including the physical activity and nutrition programs and obesity integration project. Chris joined the department in 2004, serving as the department's emergency preparedness and response director until 2011. Hi, um, so okay. Chris. Hold I'm here. on. Oh. Sorry, the poll is now closed. And as you can see, the um, majority of her, everyone responded with true, which is the correct answer. So thank you for your participation, and I will now turn it over to Mr. Lindley. Uh, thank you. So I think everybody has probably looked at the, the weight of the nation and different reports, and you know, Colorado is always labeled as one of the healthiest states. But even though we have that um, reputation for obesity not being a problem, just like every other state on the line, it is certainly a problem and a challenge here that we're trying to address. Um, so it's really challenging in this state to really raise it to a level in the mindset um, that we need to make improvements here around physical activity and healthy eating when in the media we're constantly hearing we're, we're doing okay. But the way we look at it, we're, we're winning the race um, that everybody's losing right now. Um, so I'm going to go through and talk about some of the efforts that we have related to physical activity and jump into specifics of some good examples to highlight. Um, while, again, we are one of the healthiest states, uh, since 1995 the prevalence of obesity in Colorado has doubled. Um, more than half of the Colorado adults are overweight or obese. Almost one in four children are overweight or obese. Uh, this costs uh, the Coloradans about one uh, billion dollars a year annually. So when we looked at obesity, we we first wanted to decide, you know, what is it that we're going to do, and wh where do we put our effort, and how are we going to do that? So we started out with this obesity integration project, and with that, what we did is we looked at 59 obesity strategies that were evidence based. Uh, working with all of our local partners, the nonprofit partners throughout the state, and a, a huge host of researchers um, from the university, we narrowed it down to 12 strategies that we thought we could actually make some headway here in the state of Colorado over the next few years related to obesity. And I have them listed there on the slide, and specifically the ones that are underlined relate directly to physical activity. So looking at the built environment, child care and the physical activity within child care facilities, the diabetes prevention program, schools, and worksite wellness, which um, I'll jump into a little bit more here specifically on that. Um, so here at CDPHE, uh, like at most of the other state agencies, I believe, if you look at your state employees and compare them to the general population, uh, within the state, you might find something surprising as we did, and what we found was that our, actually the state employees were not as healthy as the general population within the state of Colorado. And we did that by looking at um, uh, the data from Kaiser Permanente, which is one of our health care providers, um, insurance providers for state employees. They cover about half of the state employees, so we still pretty confident with this data that this is a, um, an accurate description of the state um, workforce. So what were our wellness, our worksite wellness initiatives? So uh, first, uh, we started off with a transportation uh, project, and we were trying to find alternatives to transportation. How can we get people moving more? And again, it's all around physical activity, and what the literature told us is those individuals that took alternative transportation actually got more physical activity throughout the day. So we de developed an incentive program around that whereby we would actually, as an entity, purchase travel coupon books to, to use the public transportation system, as well as provide incentives with maybe it be 
administrative time off or other incentives and rewards for people that took this up as an effort and, and stuck with it um, over a specific amount of time. It's been hugely successful here. Um, we've got a lot of folks involved with it. Um, we've actually issued all of our coupon books that we bought for the transportation um, project. Um, so moving forward, we know we're going to have to up that. And it's really turned out well. The second one, I think many of you have heard of the Diabetes Prevention Program. We call it the DPP. It's one of the very few evidence-based programs out there that over long term shows sustained weight loss and increased physical activity. Uh, again, working with Kaiser Permanente as one of our insurance uh, providers and healthcare providers for the employees um, within the state, we started a pilot project where we would offer the diabetes prevention program to state employees that were at um, a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, again, we kicked it off as a pilot thinking, you know, maybe we can get 25, 30 people into this pilot moving forward in this class and we can see how it works within just a few hours of sending the information out. And I'll, I'll talk about how we share that information. Uh, the pilot was, was sold out, if you will. There's no cost to the employees, but it was, it was booked out. Uh, the third strategy uh, we invested in was looking at our stair our stairways here within the, the state building. Um, for years, we, we've struggled with encouraging staff to select the stairs and use the stairs versus the elevator. And so we went to the literature and, you know, how is it that you can get people to use the stairs more so than the elevator other than just, you know, shutting off the elevators. And what we found is by making the environment more appeasing with color, uh, posters, artwork, that it would uh, bring more people into that. So we invested a very small amount into painting of the stairwells. And it wasn't all the walls. It was really just the, the flat wall as you, as you make a 90-degree uh, turn as you go back up with different light, you know, kind of warm colors. And uh, sure enough to, uh, I think, more of our surprise than we thought, we have a much higher usage of the stairwell than we've ever had. Um, it also relates to the executive director, uh, Dr. Chris Urbina, uh, Dr. Chris Urbina's use of the stairs. Not once um, have we ever seen him in the elevator in the last two years. He only uses the stairs, and I think that's a, a great uh, uh, credit to him modeling the way, and if you're you know walking with him or he sees you, he'll ensure he leads you up and down the stairs versus the elevator. And I'll talk more about that modeling the way. And the last one uh, is our, our probably our most innovative approach. We took a large storage room and turned it into a worksite wellness room. And again, with with very little investment, we actually asked for donations from the employees for exercise equipment, you know, BOSU balls, exercise balls, ping pong table, et cetera. And we were able to put together a worksite wellness room which has a ping pong table in it. And we've had huge success with that. And uh, pretty much all day, every day, there's someone in there enjoying the benefits of that room throughout the day. Um, so how, do, how did we do this and how do we sustain it? And it really comes down to um, leadership from the top, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We had to develop some departmental policies. So one of our first policies we looked at was um, around breaks and how people could use breaks. And through the Federal Work um, Labor Act, each employee is allowed two 15-minute breaks throughout an eight-hour day. And so we said, well, if we want to allow our employees to meet the physical activity requirements of two and a half hours a day, Maybe we can combine those breaks into 30-minute breaks if they wanted to use them to go out and exercise or, or do worksite wellness-related activities. And we did just that. So we uh, put in policy that they can combine their breaks at any time throughout the working day that they like to go out and do uh, physical activity activities. So essentially, with just during the work week, if they wanted to, they could participate and, and complete their two and a half hours of physical activity. We also have a healthy meeting policy where we try to ensure that all the the food that is served or provided is, is healthy and, and meets uh, specific standards. But we also have put onto the agenda uh, kind of movement breaks where 
hopefully the meeting won't go on more than 20 or 30 minutes that uh, everybody doesn't stand up and move around briefly or conduct an actual uh, standing meeting or walking meeting versus everybody sitting down um, throughout the day. We've looked at staff performance goals. We call them IPGs. Every employee uh, was asked to put a specific uh, IPG, a performance goal for next year that related to their overall uh, health and wellness. Many of them looked at physical activity and how they get more of that in the workplace. Um, and we're, of course, working with all the local fitness facilities and off-site programs that we can use moving forward. Um, engagement of leadership, I mentioned this briefly, but here's a, a prime example. That uh, picture is Dr. Urbina, the Executive Director and Chief Medical Officer of the Health Department here. And he has been out front modeling the way, uh, again, not only using the stairs every day, but he participated in a multi-day uh, biking tour uh, across the state of Colorado. And on that tour, he, he kept this live blog up where he talked about some of his experiences, his thoughts. He talked about the importance of physical activity, uh, work-life balance, et cetera. And I think, again, I can't highlight it, that enough that leadership from the top and really walking the talk makes a huge impact in uh, the other employees' comfort level in, in doing similar activities. Um, Moving forward, what's that look like for us with uh, obesity and physical activity? We have designated lead for, for both of those. So within obesity, we've broken it out to healthy eating and active living. Active living is where the physical activity is. We have standard leads there. We're working with all of our partners, internal and external. Uh, with any um, activity or initiative we're going to do, we use logic models and develop action plans. So we have real specific me measurable objectives and we understand how uh, each input should work to move us forward. We're evaluating our work. Um, so we, we feel that there's a, a void out there on evidence-based uh, measures to really increase the physical activity amongst folks. Um, and we're, we're revising our methods continuously based on emerging evidence and um, what we learned going forward. This is a, that's Dr. Urbina on the end, and this is me playing him ping pong. Um, the public health leaders, all of us on the phone, the more we can remove the barriers for the staff, uh, you know, continuously talk about a, a change in culture, um, modeling the way, ask the second tier supervisors to have buy-in and make a prioritized effort, the betters can move forward. So. Even after we had a strong executive and executive leadership team supporting it, we noticed that the mid-level supervisors um, were being perceived as the ones holding folks back from uh, participating in those walking meetings or the 30-minute activity breaks. And so how we addressed that, um, you know, just encouraging them to support it wasn't enough. We actually went into their specific evaluation, their performance evaluation plans, and wrote in it that as a supervisor, it is their responsibility to encourage, support um, those activities and uh, allow uh, employees to develop plans and you know, flexible schedules to meet those needs. Um, and that really helped us move forward. Um, that's all I have, and we'll have time for questions later. And also, uh, these are um, our two leads, Susan Motika and her um, email there. She is leading our worksite wellness program and all of our policy work, and Andrea Wagner is the head of our obesity and integration project if you want more information. Great. Thank you, Chris, for the sharing your efforts in Colorado. As you can see on your screen, we have another polling question up. Which of the following sectors could play a role in helping to promote physical activity in your community? Please go ahead and submit your answers now while I introduce our next speaker. Our final speaker is Dr. Eloise Elliott. Dr. Elliott is the Ware Distinguished Professor in the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences at West Virginia University. Her work in this role has focused on West Virginia's obesity crisis and led to the opportunity to chair the development of their statewide physical activity plan. Okay, our poll is now closed, and as you can see, everyone, nearly everyone participating, <laughs> partic chose the correct answer of all of the above. So, as you're making your plans, consider all of these sectors um, to promote physical activity in your state. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Elliott. 
Good afternoon, and thank you, Kristen, for the introduction. I represent my colleagues from the West Virginia Physical Activity Plan Central Coordination Team as I share with you our successes in developing a statewide physical activity plan modeled after the National Physical Activity Plan that was released in 2010. I also have here with me today Dr. Sean Bulger, who's an associate professor in the WVU College of Physical Activity and Sport Sciences, who will be available to help answer questions later in the webinar. Our presentation will focus primarily on providing just a brief overview of the development process of the what we call Active West Virginia, the West Virginia Physical Activity Plan, some details on the involvement of key stakeholders from all societal sectors, just a bit about some of the strategic development techniques we use during the de development process, and, and a little about, um, I, know, I guess, a brief overview of some of our current efforts related to dissemination, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, Kristen, I'm having trouble now with my next slide. Okay, I'll advance the slides for you. Thank you. West Virginia is a small rural Appalachian state with a population of a little less than 2 million and a median income of about $38,000. Out of our 50 states in the U.S., West Virginia ranks at the top of the list in the prevalence of most chronic diseases, and we also have one of the highest rates of obesity and physical activity, as you might imagine. Um, in addition, we also know that besides the concern for early morbidity and, and mortality of our citizens, poor health contributes to rising health care costs in the state. And compared to the national average, West Virginia spends about 13% more per person on health care. Next slide, please. To change this culture, it has become clear that we must establish a common goal of making physical activity a health priority, we must get everyone involved in the solution, and we must work to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Next. The National Physical Activity Plan provided the evidence-based framework for states to develop context-specific plans that focus on environmental systems and policy change. The National Plan used the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans as their foundation, and they called on states to do that as well. Next slide, please. So what were the initial first steps that we did in West Virginia as we began to develop this plan? Um, well, to begin with, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to be a part of the education sector in the development of the national plan, and I participated in a strategic planning meeting in D.C. in the summer of 2009. And during the national plan development process, it became clear that we in West Virginia really needed to develop a state physical activity plan modeled from the national plan, and one that all our state and private organizations and agencies from all the different societal sectors could contribute to and adopt and use in their own health-related plans that would really move physical activity promotion to a higher priority in our state. And so using the national plan as a blueprint, a group of interested persons convened and we developed the aim of the plan, we identified key components of a successful plan, and we conceptualized a strategic direction that involved expertise and input from key leaders that represented the all eight sectors. Next. The aim of, the, of Active West Virginia is to create a statewide culture that facilitates physical, physically active lifestyles in every societal sector and in every region of our state, regardless of socio-demographic factors or other barriers that we may face. We hope that the plan will facilitate then change in policy and practice that will ultimately result in increased levels of physical activity to meet or exceed the national recommendations as they are outlined in the guidelines. Next. Through the guidance of the national plan, discussions we had with representatives from the national plan and research related to effective implementation of strategic plans, the following key ingredients were identified as critical to, the effect, to an effective plan. First, input and participation from all population sectors. That's a must. A unified team working towards a solution that includes dedicated state and local key stakeholder groups and organizations, the ones that can really make it happen when you get to implementation. They can really help to implement the plan. 
And then those policy leaders, particularly those that already see physical activity as a health priority and that will advocate for policy change to provide more localized physical activity opportunities. Next. Again, barring from the national plan, we use these eight sectors that were, we targeted these eight sectors as those that would need key leadership in the plan development and implementation process. We also added a ninth sector, if you will, policy. Um, and so I'll show you a little bit more of the different groups we targeted within those sectors as leaders in just a moment. But the next slide will show you, um, next slide please, I'm sorry I can't advance those. Um, but as part of the initial plan development process, the first thing we did was um, we held a statewide physical activity symposium that resulted in identification of key stakeholders and it also we did had working groups during the symposium that helped identify the steps, the first steps in plan development. Then we worked on developing capacity through meetings with these key stakeholders and policy leaders all across the state. And then we developed a leadership team which included the coordinating committee and the sector teams that represented all the eight sectors. And all of this contributed to more buy-in and support from the people that we needed to buy in, to, that we needed the buy-in from. Next slide, please. Representatives from each of these organizations and agencies that you see here listed under the sectors were asked to serve as members of the sector teams to help develop the written plan. Um, and we had one or two individuals that then served as chairs of their respective teams. There are approximately 80 sector team members, um, and the individuals are actually listed in the plan on our website if you want to actually see the names of the folks that participated um, in this planning process. Next slide. During the development of the written plan, we used a strategic process that included an online concept mapping exercise that identified the five priority areas that we used in the plan. Um, then we convened the sector teams in face-to-face -face meetings where they finalized the sector-specific strategies and tactics. And in doing that, they took into account the national plan strategies and tactics, the results of the concept mapping, and the expertise and experience that they brought to the table um, from their specific sectors. And then we held an official launch of the plan as a statewide media event. Next. I just wanted to give you a little overview of the online content mapping technique that we used to gather input from all citizens across the state. Um, because it was a unique approach that worked for us. We used software from Concept Systems Global that allowed us to gather information through technology supported methodologies and then evaluate the ideas through a concept mapping approach to determine what people all across the state thought should happen. And we asked them the question um, to tell us one specific thing that needs to happen to increase or promote physical activity in West Virginia. This technique allowed us to conduct a brainstorming activity and then sort and rate the statements by feasibility and importance and then interpret the results. Next slide, please. What this did was um, it resulted in five priority areas that we used in the plan. And within these five priority areas, every sector then developed strategies and tactics for each of the five priority areas. Next. Active West Virginia 2015, the West Virginia Physical Activity Plan was released January 19, 2012 with a statewide event, um, many statewide events and local events surrounding the release. And you can see this on our website and I'll give you that address in a minute. Next slide. We launched the plan at our state's capital with the governor and key legislators taking part in the ceremonies. We also encouraged county and local events at schools and in communities to promote the plan and to pr promote physical activity. We had excellent media coverage throughout the state and in all of our state's major media networks. And most all of the county policy leaders signed resolutions making it West Virginia Physical Activity Day. Um, next slide. As did our governor, Governor Earl Ray Tomlin, and this was during the event. And next slide, you can see where the Senate of our West Virginia legislature um, also signed a resolution and presented it to us. Next slide. 
Over the course of the plan development process, we learned that some of the key elements of success included the buy-in and participation from a leadership team that includes those key stakeholders that can really implement the plan, ongoing capacity building, a systematic approach to de the development of the content of the plan, and then public awareness from the beginning, critical. Next slide. Also of utmost importance is a structure in place moving forward for central coordination, implementation, dissemination, and evaluation. And this is just an overview, but um, we have a number of key agencies and organizations that are partnering with us to do a variety of things. Um, some of those key state agencies that I'll just mention is our state health agency, the Bureau for Public Health, the West Virginia Department of Education, Office of Healthy Schools, and the West Virginia State Park System. Um, in terms of dissemination, we are in stage one of a social marketing campaign that's underway to disseminate the plan through all parts of the state. It was in all uh, sector-specific venues. And the evaluation procedures for the active West Virginia plan are being devised during, as we speak, by a team of researchers and evaluation experts and will follow the lead of the national plan's evaluation procedures. They will include process evaluation documenting the plan development process, uh, impact evaluation to determine short-term impact on implementation of public awareness, environmental programming and policy change, and then of course outcome evaluation monitoring the long-term influence on state progress towards the broader health, public health goals related to physical activity, such as those in Healthy People 2020 and those measured in the BRFSS. So in closing, um, on the last slide, you'll see um, my contact information and the website address. I'm happy to entertain some of your questions during the webinar, but if you would like more information, please don't hesitate to contact us at, um, either through the website or at my email address. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Elliott, for sharing about your work being done in West Virginia. We will now move into the Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question, please chat it into the box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. We've had a few questions come in um, throughout the presentation. So we'll start. Um, this question is for Colorado. Um, does your, do your policies apply to all Colorado state government or just the public health department? Uh, currently just the public health department, but we're working with the Department of Personnel Administration to um, hopefully roll them out at a, at a larger level. Great. Thank you. And a question for Dr. Elliott. Um, how are the implementation and dissemination parts of the West Virginia Physical Activity Plan funded? Um, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> oh, we we uh, ask ourselves that every day. Actually, um, there we have been able to secure funding from various um, groups and agencies, smaller pots of funding, but we are still in the process of identifying um, funding, more sustainable funding that can really um, help sustain the central coordination of the plan. In terms of implementation, um, we know that much of the implementation needs to happen at the local level. So we encourage the um, we encourage communities and counties to apply for grants to help to develop their programmatic ideas that they have. And, um, and we as a central coordination team have also uh, gotten some larger grants that with larger implementation projects. But um, I think that's a, not being a part of a government agency, I think that is a barrier um, in terms of the sustainability is the funding. Great. Thank you. And this question is for everyone. Um, specifically, what are the culturally appropriate strategies in developing these programs? I guess we will start with Dr. Butner. Do you have a 
response for that? Sure. Um, there isn't anything that's specific in the guidelines um, about different um, recommendations for different cultural groups. Um, obviously, the implementation of the guidelines will vary based on the group that you're working with and the specific population. But in terms of the overall guidelines are for, for all Americans, um, all walks of life, all areas of the country. Um, and I think it, it just depends on specifically where you are and the, the group that you're working with as to how best encourage people to engage in physical activity. And Colorado's had some great examples with within their population and, and West Virginia as well. So I, I think it's a little bit specific to who you're working with and, and kind of what what works best. Okay, great. And Colorado, do you have a response? Yeah, what we did is when we looked at the, the guidelines, and, and the guidelines say it, it nicely, is you know, two and a half hours a day, but it doesn't really matter necessarily how you do it in specific. So we just, again, are encouraging folks to, to move and get active as much as they can versus weighing specifically on the specific type of activities they should do because, you know, everybody's at different levels, uh, different cultures uh, move in different ways. So we're just trying to stick with the overall time versus the specifics. Great. Thanks. And Dr. Elliott? Yeah, this is this is yeah, this is Sean Bolger. Uh, I was involved with the plan development. Uh, I think I think in the case of uh, of our strategic planning exercise, really we didn't want it to be uh, an academic exercise uh, where, it was, where it was just looked on uh, folks at the university putting together another strategic plan. So we were very conscientious of um, you know using that web-based approach so that we could get uh, as as much participation as possible across all sectors within the state and, and all geographic regions were also represented. So uh, we wanted the planning process to be as in, inclusive as possible. And, and we really looked at our role as, uh, as more, more or less being facilitators of, of the process as opposed to actually generating the plan. Great. Thank you. And this question is for Colorado. What was the response to the performance review and physical activity and how did you overcome concerns regarding that? Oh, great question. So uh, at first it came with a lot of resistance. Um, it's not a specific performance review of how they do in physical activity. It's specifically when they wrote their individual performance goals, they would write a specific goal related to uh, their health and wellness and something they can do in the workplace that would benefit them. So the, the negativity, if you will, or the resistance wasn't from the ground uh, contributing staff. It was more from the mid-level supervisors that were under the belief that anything other than the work that they wanted them to do would take away from the uh, productivity of the employees. But once again, once we addressed it with them that it was something that they were you know, supposed to participate in and support, it moved a lot quicker. Now. Um, there's absolutely zero resistance against it. People have really appreciated it and, and like it again. And once you kind of make that switch and get through that initial resistance, everybody kind of lightens up and says, oh, yeah, this makes sense and are supportive of it. Great, thanks. And a second question came in about that is, um, would you be able to um, share your performance review form? Oh yeah, yeah. We can give, we can share the actual example. We we wrote um, draft IPGs, etc. We could do all that. No problem. Great, thank you. And this question is for West Virginia. Uh, did you approach health insurance companies to be involved and support the effort? Uh, yes, we we have not approached them. Um, for financial support at this point, um, but we had the um, the head of the largest, I would say, well, the uh, public employee insurance agency, um, the director of of that insurance was one of our team set was a sector team leader, um, I believe, for the healthcare for healthcare, and um, and we also. Um, had another we, we did have the 
them represented as sector team members, and so they've been in the loop, and they've and they have been uh, part of the development process, and um, so they and they have supported the plan in other ways in terms of uh, financial support. We haven't gotten to that piece yet, but I think it's a possibility. Great, thanks. And I'm not sure this question is for, but maybe uh, Dr. Butner could address it first, and then um, Chris and. Dr. Elliott, how are persons with disabilities and state agencies serving persons with disabilities included? Thanks, Kristen. I mentioned this briefly in the webinar um, in terms of the overall physical activity recommendations for those with disabilities, um, and it, it really they're encouraged um, to the best of their ability to engage in the engage in physical activity and to meet the guidelines. Um, but it, it depends a lot on, on a person's ability, and so the guidelines themselves recommend um, consultation with a, with a health care provider and ensuring you're doing activities for your own ability and obviously um, being safe while doing those. But there's no separate guidelines. They're just encouraged to, to be active and, and avoid inactivity if possible. Great. And did um, Colorado or West Virginia have anything to add regarding disabilities? Uh, this is Colorado. We we really don't. Again, we're just we're open to anything that they define that is beneficial to them and supportive of it. Yeah, and in terms of West Virginia, um, in, in some of the strategies and tactics, uh, the specific sec the sector specific strategies and tactics. Um, there were there were uh, recommendations uh, specific to to folks with, um, with with disabilities. Yes. Great, thank you. And I have another question for Colorado. How did you measure the increase in stair usage, and how did you measure the transit alternative program? Uh, uh, two great questions. So we didn't have any specific uh, measures when we started the stair program, and that question came up, and so. How we've measured it since then is looking at, so to get into the elevators, um, here you've got to use your, your card, which has um, one of those magnetic strips to get the, the elevators opening. So we can see how many people are using the elevators any given day and compare it historically. So we've actually gone and done that and, and found that it's reduced a lot. So that's one way with solid data we can show that there's been more people using the stairs. The other way is just qualitative, you know, talking to folks and, and seeing the difference. I mean, the stairwells are now, uh, you know, if you will, littered with people going up and down conversations. They're very noisy. Where in the past, you would never see anybody in there. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question as well? Um, how did you measure the transit alternative program? Transit. Okay, so we're, we're issuing the um, coupon books. And we have a Google form that they fill out each week of the alternative transportations that they're taking, which is tracking not only the method, the miles and distance covered, um, time, et cetera. So we're able to map and graph you know, uh, gallons of gas saved, hopefully um, carbon release in the air. Because here at Colorado, we also have the environmental side of the health department. We're not just public health. We have environmental quality and control here too. So we're measuring the carbon footprint as well saved in, in those measures as we go forward. And I'm happy to share that as well with the group and how we've done that. Great. Thanks. Um, a question came in for West Virginia. How has West Virginia State Health Agency been a part of the active West Virginia plan? Well, the, um, the West Virginia Bureau for Public Health contributed a great deal to the development process of the plan. Um, Joe Barker, who's the Director of Office of Epidemiology and Health Promotion, he serves as a chair of the public health sector. And he has also been instrumental in the planning process, not only as a sector team leader, but also as a consultant for the plan development team, recommending key stakeholders and making contacts for capacity building, in, in including his staff members in his office and various aspects of the development process. So we work fairly closely with them on this. Um, we are currently working with them to develop the second West Virginia Physical Activity Symposium, which will be held in August of this year, uh, where we'll showcase current implementations of the strategies and tactics and uh, 
just garner input for year two. So, so that's how we worked with um, our state health agency at this point. Great, thanks. And a uh, question for Dr. Butner. Uh, when will the next version of the guidelines be released? So as I mentioned previously, the first edition of the Physical Activity Guidelines came out in 2008. Um, there's currently not a mandate for the guidelines to be released on a regular cycle. Um, the dietary guidelines are released every five years as mandated. And so one of the things we did, um, realizing that people would like to continue um, with the work of the guidelines and obviously to continue the emphasis on physical activity is, is working on the mid-course report, which I mentioned at the end of my presentation. And that will be released um, in March this year and be kind of an add-on to the guidelines themselves, but not change the specific recommendations, um, but just highlight some of the intervention strategies in the youth population. And it's our hope that we'll be able to repeat the guidelines um, in the future, possibly on a 10-year cycle, to examine the, the full science again and, and take a closer look at things as the science has evolved. Great, thank you. And at this time, we're going to end the Q&A. If you have any follow-up questions, please contact me or the speakers directly. Thank you again for joining us today. As I mentioned, this is the first webinar in our Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans webinar series and will be hosted over the next couple of months. The presentations from today's webinar will be available on our website within the next few days. The web address is on your screen now. Please check our newsletters and website for more information regarding our upcoming webinars. If you would like to subscribe to ASTO's Primary Care and Prevention Network newsletter, please email me at kwan at asto.org. As I mentioned earlier, there is a link to the evaluation for this webinar. You can also find a, a link in the chat box. Unfortunately, it wasn't able to hyperlink. But if you could copy and paste that into your web browser and complete the survey, we would really appreciate it as it provides us with useful information for our future projects. It also has questions related to the work you are doing to improve physical activity in your state. We look forward to hearing about your efforts and learning about how you are using the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans in your agency or organization. Again, I would like to thank the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion for sponsoring this webinar, and especially my colleagues Julia Schneider and Elizabeth Walker Romero for their support in planning today's event. I again would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Katrina Butner, Chris Lindley, and Dr. Eloise Elliott. We hope that all of the listeners will use this webinar as a resource and will share the link with others once it is available. Thank you, and have a good rest of your day.